welcome to our express service. Let us pray. Oh, loving Lord, we thank you that as we bring our praises and our prayers to you this morning, we can receive your most holy word. We can receive from you challenge and encouragement in our lives. So we ask by the power of the Holy Spirit that as we read and as we reflect on your word, we might be changed and transformed and inspired and led in your everlasting way, the way that leads to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Well, our Bible reading is uh, Matthew 15, verses 21 to 28. Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 to 28. And I'll be reading that from the English Standard Version. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we're looking together at Matthew 5, as I said, verses 21 to 28, under the title, Jesus Rewards Great Faith. Jesus Rewards Great Faith. We're looking at a dramatic encounter between Jesus and the Canaanite woman, as she's described. And the background to this woman's great faith is great discouragement. Now, I learned a little bit about discouragement when our Vauxhall Sephira broke down at the far end of France the week before last uh, with a coolant problem. I arrived outside the garage to which the car had been recovered at 10 to 12 on Monday morning. Uh, I could see my car through the fence, um, a bit like a captured prisoner. Um, there was nothing moving, no sign of life. And I hovered in the shade nearby, and after about an hour of waiting, at 10 to 1, a car drew up outside the compound, and the receptionist got out to open the gate. And I rushed over, and I said, that's my car waiting there in the compound. All I need to do is to get in, try putting a little bit of coolant in and running the engine. Ah, she said, waving her salad box at me. She said, you can't do that till 2 o'clock. It's my lunch hour. I thought, it's your lunch day. So I waited another hour until the proper time and I could get in and I could top up the coolant. Sadly, uh, the problems of the car were a bit more severe than that and had to be scrapped in the end. And that was the start of many adventures as we made our way home on foot and we learned a lot about how to pack for a holiday. Um, as we navigated with our uh, supplies, a total of four buses, two days of car hire, two cabs, uh, one hotel and some great kindness as well. So thankfully there was a happy ending. But I learned a bit about discouragement and also things ending well. What is the faith journey of the woman in this story? And what are her discouragements? And how, does, and how and why does it end so well? Well, let's look at the great discouragement of this woman. Verse 21. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Now, the first point I want to make here is that she has a desperate pro problem. They say, as a parent, you're only as happy as your least happy child. And this means that the spiritual distress of the daughter has been visited upon the shoulders of the mother. Furthermore, the appeal that she makes to Jesus is perfectly framed. She says in verse 22, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. So she says, Have mercy on me, because she recognizes that she cannot buy Jesus' favor. 
Only his mercy can help her. She proclaims him Lord, recognizing his power of the spiritual realm. She proclaims him the son of David, recognizing his royal lineage and his political power over the earthly realm. She accurately nails the spiritual problem her daughter faces. She says very bluntly in verse 22, my daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. So her situation is desperate. Her appeal is perfect. But in terms of response, heaven is silent. Verse 23, but Jesus did not answer her a word. Now, if you're in the position of this woman, you're facing a desperate situation for which you have prayed a wisdom-filled and scripture-inspired prayers in your life, and heaven has remained silent. I hope this is of some encouragement to you. We're being warned here that this does happen to godly people whose prayers are faith-filled. Your frustrating predicament is reflected in the experience of this woman, who is later most highly commended. So I cannot give you an easy answer, but can I assure you that your predicament is respected in Scripture, and it is part, obviously, of a larger, long-going, ongoing story, the end of which we have yet to see. Unfortunately for this woman, there is worse to come. The disciples show a distinct lack of compassion. Verse 24, and his disciples came and begged him, saying, send her away, for she is crying out after us. They just want her to go away. I find it in incredulous that in their determination to get rid of this woman and to enjoy the quiet life, the determination seems to match the desperation of the woman to see her child healed. But sadly, that is often true, isn't it? If you're facing a desperate situation, people might well say silly or unkind things. They just want it all to go away. And on top of all of this, heaven is silent again. Verse 24, Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In other words, you don't qualify. Now I want to pause at this moment and I want to ask a simple question. Is the message of this passage, if you have enough faith, you will receive the healing for which you ask, okay? Now I believe in God's power to heal, but just imagine me going to visit a parishioner, perhaps is awaiting an operation in Watford General, and the moment I pray for them, they're healed. They step out of the bed, they demand a medical examination to validate it, they're declared well, they call their family, they start to pack their things. Other patients on the ward get very excited, they wave me over and I pray for them, and they're all healed. There's uproar, they all demand to be checked, they call their families, they pack their things, and the ward starts to empty as they head down to reception. Sister gets a call from other wards. They've heard there's a very special faith healer on the prowl. Can I visit their wards? So I work through the whole hospital and everybody I pray for is healed. People start flooding out of the hospital. Huge traffic jams develop across Watford for the very first time as rel relatives come and pick them up. The news spreads through the social media like wildfire. Now people whose operations have been delayed by the pandemic start turning up at the hospital reception and coming onto the wards for healing. The press arrive outside. Camera crews start a set up in the car park. Two helicopters hover over the hospital, filming through the windows, hoping to catch a healing in action. The hospital declares a major incident. This is the first time they've had to do it because too many people are being made well. On the way out, overcome by excitement, one elderly woman faints and has to be brought back up to the ward and healed again. Later that night, I need a police escort to get home. My little Nissan Micra rather enjoying the attention. I'm rather enjoying the attention. Invitations flood in to appear on chat shows. Everybody's talking about the wonder vicar from Chorleywood with the amazing healing gift. And no one is talking about their need to come to God in repentance and faith before they finally, no matter what healing they receive, run out of time. Now, please understand, I'm not mocking either our need from heal for healing or God's power to heal. My own father was touched by the supernatural healing power of God. And I believe God has the power to intervene supernaturally in the physical and spiritual realm, in the affairs of nations, in our finances, our careers, our relationships. But I think we can all appreciate that if it was just a question of having enough faith and getting the healing that we demand, 
there might be unforeseen consequences, even disastrous spiritual consequences, which God in His loving power has decided that He will save us from. The two big dangers seem to be too little faith on our part that God will heal, and too much excitement if He does. So I don't think this passage is saying, if you've got enough faith, you'll be healed. You know, like a slot machine. You put enough money in, the chocolate will come out. Healing occurs in this passage, but the message seems to be something different. And I believe the healing occurs here to demonstrate Jesus' divine authority and to emphasize, to underline his message in this passage. What is the message? Well, the woman is rebuffed three times. In verse 23, Jesus does not answer. In verse 24, Jesus says, you don't qualify. Finally, verse 25, she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. It's a unique, intimate, desperate appeal to God. You sense her helplessness. But actually, this is the, this is the only way to come to God. We come to him empty-handed. And we are asking for his power to be at work in our lives. And would you believe it? There is more discouragement for this woman to come. For the third time, she is rebuffed. Verse 26, and Jesus answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And Jesus makes a reference here to the Orthodox Jewish position, which was regard themselves as the children of Israel, which is supported by Scripture, and to condemn other nations in a blanket condemnation, Gentiles in their entirety, as dogs. He modifies it a little to give her hope. Okay, he uses a diminutive form here, which refers to much love patently pets. But that's not much of a modification. This is really not a very encouraging response to a woman who has repeatedly appealed to Jesus to heal her demon-possessed child. I think we can safely say, without a shadow of doubt, great is this woman's discouragement. Now, where is the great faith? Okay. We've looked at great discouragement. Where is the great faith? Verse 27, she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. What I think is remarkable about this woman's insistence is that she is interested even in the crumbs of divine blessing because God's crumbs are a million times better than this world's feasts. She effectively says to Jesus, even if you do not give me the blessing that I seek, I will receive the blessing that you give. And one of the hallmarks of this woman's approach to God is her persistence. Does persistence on the part of believers matter? Yeah, in some, in some situations, it is the persistence of the believer which is the miracle. It's the persistence of the believer which is the material evidence of God at work. In the World News sections of the, section of the magazine Evangelicals Now, I read this report just in from the Gospel Coalition and from the charity Open Doors. Quote, an expert on Islamic terrorism has expressed alarm after gunmen stormed a church in southwest Nigeria, killing as many as 50 worshippers. The brutal attack on San Francis Javier Church in the city of Owo is but the latest episode in a long line of violence against Christians in Nigeria. Its additional significance is that it took place in a part of the country that had largely escaped such violence in recent years. For years, the most widespread attacks unfolded in northeastern Nigeria, as the Islamic terrorist group Boko Haram executed a relentless campaign of violence against Christians and churches in that region. The hills of northern Nigeria eventually became a landscape of burnt-down churches and looted homes. In many cases, roving militants had climbed onto church roofs to rip down crosses before burning the buildings to the ground. But while churches sat in ashes, believers returned to worship. Some gathered in makeshift huts built from trees cut down by young church members. Others set up chairs in the shell of the torched buildings. In a temporary shelter bit built by a congregation in the city of Gombe, for example, the churchgoers hung a banner next to the destroyed church building, announcing the theme for their summer Bible studies from Romans. Quote, we are more 
than conquerors. They don't even have a church building left, but they have great faith. And the evidence of God at work is their persistence. It's a persistence spoken of by the prophet Job, who said in Job 19, verse 25, when he looked forward to that individual encounter and commendation that he expected in, through faith to receive from God, he said these words, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. So in conclusion, what is the main thing which matters more than anything else in this passage? It is those four words of commendation to this woman and to everybody else who keeps going when heaven is silent. Verse 28, great is your faith. Live your life seeking the commendation of God and nothing else, and you will have great faith. You will keep going when heaven is silent and others give up. You will approach God directly and humbly, and you will say to God, in effect, if you do not give me the blessing I seek, I will receive the blessing you give, and I will value your crumbs more than this world's feasts. And when everything else has disappeared, you will receive this commendation from God when you see Jesus face to face, when it's just you and him standing facing, facing each other, he will say these words of commendation, a commendation which matters more than anything else in the universe. Great is your faith. Let us pray. We take a, a moment now just in case you want to bring to God a desperate situation you're facing and want to pray in faith to him noting the persistence of this woman in her pursuit of God. And then after a moment of silent reflection, for you to do that, I'll pray. Loving Lord, thank you for warning me in this passage that my discipleship path may involve great discouragement. Thank you for recognizing that discouragement in Scripture. Help me to keep going when heaven is silent and to value the crumbs of Christ more than the feasts of this world. Even if I do not receive the blessing I seek, help me to continue to walk with great faith and receive from you, the blessing you give. Above all, help me respond to you in repentance and faithful discipleship and receive from you in eternity those words of priceless commendation. Great is your faith. For the sake of your Son, my Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And may the blessing of God Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love, now and evermore. Amen. God bless. Faithful.